Hi, it's Robin. This is part two of my series for Sep Tandy. We're looking at my collection of Tandy Radio Shack computers. Part one covered from about 1980 to 1983, and then this picks up 1983, 1984 through to 1987. First thing we'll look at is the micro color computer model MC10. I've got the box for it here. They originally sold for $139.95 Canadian. I'm actually not sure where I got this from, but if somebody gave it to me, thank you. I'm sorry I've forgotten. It was a long time ago. So here is the computer. It's fairly small and $139 Canadian or probably about $100 US. It was obviously the very low end. As far as I know, it was the cheapest computer that Radio Shack sold. If you look at the keyboard, it might actually remind you of something. The way that it has these basic command names above the keys, a small collection of graphical characters here on the left, only one shift key, and that would be the Sinclair ZX81, or here in North America, the Timex Sinclair 1000, which is essentially just the same as the ZX81. And here's the Sinclair keyboard. Again, with the basic commands above the keys, the graphic characters over here, a single shift key. But really, Radio Shack did improve on it quite a bit. The MC10, instead of just a flat membrane key, actually does have these depressible chiclet keys, has an actual space bar. Really, it is quite a bit nicer. It's a very simple machine, though. No ports at all on this side. On the back, it just has cassette, serial I.O., a big red reset button. That's rather nice. The TV output. That's an RF signal. And there's the AC adapter. On-off switch at the side. A channel 3 or 4 selector here. And a nice shiny badge. Hey, you passed. So while it was meant to compete with this low end of the market, it seems to have taken them too long to get, actually get it out to market. This didn't release until 1983. So when you think about it, the VIC-20 is already on the way out, which had you know, a much nicer keyboard, but the Commodore 64 had been out for approaching a year with its price rapidly coming down to the point where for maybe just $100 more, you could buy a C64, which is a vastly better computer. And meanwhile, the Commodore and other computers were squeezing the price of Tandy's color computers down as well. So really, there was very little place for this by the time it came out. Had Radio Shack launched this at a competitive price back in 1981 or maybe even 1982, this might have caught on a little better. However, I have a soft spot for these cheap machines, and what I like about them is I was a kid with no computer until late 1983 when I bought the Timex Sinclair. And maybe this would have been an okay purchase. Guess what I'm getting at is that even a very low-end computer was better than no computer. So I'm kind of fond of these machines, whether or not they were successful, whether or not they were powerful. They could just hook up to the TV and let a kid program and make those games that they were dreaming of, like I was. And a big shout out to Jim Gary, a fellow Canadian who is still writing games for the MC-10. It seems to me that he writes a new game every week and has done so for like years, for decades. He's extremely prolific and still added in 2020. I'll put a link in the description to his YouTube channel if you want to check out some of the little games that he makes for this computer. Here's a few clips of games that he's made. And you can find a lot more on his YouTube channel. I'm a big fan, Jim. Keep at it. Okay, I've got the microcolor computer hooked up now. You can see it's running Microcolor Basic 1.0, copyright 1982 by Microsoft. This is very close to the same basic that is in the color computer. I mentioned those commands across the top. Now on the Sinclair, those basic commands that are here on the keyboard, they're marketed as convenient shortcuts, 
But in fact, this basic you can't even type in. If you want to type in print or clear or continue or whatever, letter by letter, it will not accept it. You must use the shortcuts on this. That's because this basic, one of the shortcuts it takes, is forcing the user to tokenize the basic commands by pressing the correct key. They actually shrunk their ROM size for their basic interpreter by forcing the user to do that. And it's arguably a bit of a benefit too. Meanwhile, the microcolor computer is actually running a proper Microsoft basic. Well, I say proper. <laughs> it's, it's got a lot more in common with the basic that's in the Commodore machines. And so you can both type the commands in full and as an extra feature, I guess as a, a way of competing with the Sinclair, they added these shortcut keys, which are, as far as I know, totally optional. And actually they would have used up more ROM space with this little feature here. So all that to say, if I hold down the control key down in the bottom left corner and press the eight, which has CLS above it, then the CLS clear screen command just appears automatically. And then we can show that Easter egg, or if I type in like a color like 10 in honor of the MC10 and enter, it prints Microsoft on the screen. So that's that same Easter egg we showed earlier. But amusingly, Microsoft is hidden a second time in this computer. As far as we know, even Microsoft themselves didn't realize it at the time. This information comes from Michael Steele, who has the super excellent pagetable.com website that is loaded with information. So if we just make sure there's nothing in memory, list. So we'll type in a program and I'll show you Microsoft in memory. It's unfortunate that CHR string doesn't have a shortcut because that takes five keystrokes, including the shift. And this keyboard is nicer than the Spectrum, but still only having the one shift over here is annoying. I sure would like a second shift. Peak and the semicolon. And next. Okay, if we run. And you see how it prints Microsoft out on the screen. Now I deliberately printed 10 bytes, but only nine letters appeared. The 10th byte is not part of a string. Okay, I point that out because the next Easter egg I'm about to show is 10 characters long. New. So the second Microsoft string is in a different part of memory. Now at 55085, this is a few hundred bytes earlier in the ROM, to 55. 076 step minus one. So this is actually going backwards in memory. And for now, we'll do that same character string. I'm going to fill in some of the gaps later. So that's line 50 for now. Okay, we'll run that. You see what prints on the screen is partly garbage, but you see four of the letters are from the string Microsoft. So not only is the string backwards, they've also deliberately obfuscated it. So we'll fill in some of the gaps here. Instead for line 20, we're going to peek it from memory and we'll use the AND operator AND 63. That will save the bottom six bits that we've peaked, but strip off or clear the top the two high bits, which were just basically garbage put there deliberately to hide this string. I've still left one line out. We'll get to that in a moment. So we'll try running it again. Well, what happens now? <laughs> in fact, the Microsoft string mostly disappears, but just an exclamation mark remains. So here's the really amusing thing is that not only is the string hidden backwards, obfuscated with high bits, but it's actually a Petsky string that is Commodore's variation or variant of ASCII. The Tandy computers use regular ASCII, at least more than the Commodore machines do. This hidden string is part of Bill Gates' infamous Microsoft Easter egg that he hid in the Commodore PET 
back in 1977's BASIC version for that. And through all the porting, even though BASIC on the PET was 6502, the people who did that port didn't realize what those magic bytes in memory were for, and they just left them alone. So we have to make one more fix here. We'll add a line 30. If A is less than 32, then A equals A plus 64. And let's run it. Microsoft with an exclamation mark on the end, the same as in the Commodore PET. This, so this is a separate string. And line 30 that we just added, that translates from Petski over to ASCII. So all this time, that Commodore PET Easter egg has been living in this and actually other color computers as well that share the same basic. Okay, on to the color computer two. Switching computers. Here I've got the Color Computer 2, which shares a lot in common with the original Color Computer that I showed last episode. Speaking of which, I mentioned that that Color Computer 1 had been donated to me by the Foster family, that is, Foster with a capital F, and who was watching but Mary Ellen Foster, Senior Lecturer in Social Robotics at Glasgow University, and she sent this picture. So that's Mary in the early 1980s with not just any color computer, but that exact same one that I showed last episode. So that's pretty fantastic. That's a great picture. And thanks again, Mary, for arranging for me to have that computer. So this color computer 2 is actually very similar to the color computer 1. With hardly any improvements, it was mostly a cost reduction, so lots of consolidating of chips, and apparently they removed the 12 volt line from the expansion port, and as a result, some peripherals that relied on it wouldn't work. So by 1983 standards, this was not a very impressive computer in light of the Commodore 64 and other advancements that had been made. So once again, that Microsoft Easter egg is there. Now, I do find this keyboard quite nice. Now, that green screen is still troublesome. It amazed me that there is no straightforward way to change it. If we do a regular clear screen, like CLS 0 to black, that green comes back as soon as any lines are printed. Hello. <laughs> so, apparently this is a limitation of the video chip. I asked on a color computer group on Facebook and got quite a few responses. Thank you very much to everybody there. There are suggestions of doing hardware modifications, of buying new video expansions, uh, all sorts of stuff. The most straightforward software fixed, <laughs> but it's not much of a fix, is to try this poke 359, 0, colon, and then the screen command with parameters 0, 1. If you find the black on green hard on your eyes, this might be even worse. Oh, watch out. Oh, <laughs> so I don't know. I might find that slightly better. <laughs> Whew. Okay, I'll just do that Microsoft Easter egg again, just for completeness sake. So these are different memory addresses because the ROM is in a different location in this machine than on the micro color computer. A little bit of Petsky conversion there. And there we go. Microsoft. Just to look at the, the ports on it. Nothing on that side at all. Notice there's no external power supply. It's included in the machine which is kind of nice, but it also runs a little hot and the transformer makes a little bit of noise. And on the back, there's this great big power button. There's the RF output channel three or four selector. Actually only has RF output, which isn't very impressive again for 1983. It does have two joystick ports. 
serial I.O. cassette interface and a reset button. And on the side here, it does have a cartridge port and maybe another episode, I'll look at some games for this or something. And there's the badge on the bottom, part number 26-3136. What is that crazy thing somebody stuck on there? And hey, it passed. Oh yeah, and I briefly showed this last episode, so I cleaned it all up. Looks pretty nice now, it's a little bit yellowed, but I am okay with that. This is the one I bought at a thrift shop for $6.99. Okay, and here's the Color Computer 3, which has an improved keyboard layout. This is the one I bought for $5.99 at a thrift shop. So again, with the power button, two joystick ports, serial I.O. and cassette, RF and Chow 3. A big improvement here, it has actual composite video and a separate audio out, so you're not dependent on that RF. There's the reset button, again with the cartridge port. I don't think I have the right cable to use that, but it does have, also have RGB out down here. And a place to run a cord out. And here, 128K Color Computer 3. Okay, so we've got the Color Computer 3 powered up here. And on the screen there, Extended Color Basic 2.0, copyright 8286 by Tandy. Under license from Microsoft and Microware Systems. So this really is a great way to finish off the color computer line. They improve the computer in a lot of ways. The extra RAM, the 6809 processor, that is a very nice processor that was in the Coco 1 and 2, is now running at double the speed, almost 2 megahertz. It has an improved video chip, can do up to an 80 column mode. So it still powers up in the 32 column mode. And if you do the clear screen, it prints the Microsoft. But here's where it gets interesting. If you change the screen width to 40, and then do the same Easter egg, it prints out Microware Systems Corp, or Corporation, which is a company in Iowa that produced the OS9 operating system, which ran on this computer and is Really quite an interesting operating system where we're not going to get into that today. I don't think I even have the equipment to run it. But it's interesting that they kind of uh, <laughs> took that Microsoft Easter egg and made it their own as they were in charge of a lot of the work on this machine. They even upped it. If you go CLS 100 and press enter, it prints out T. Harris and T. Earls who were two of the developers for the, the firmware for the operating system on this computer. And if you go into 80 column mode, it's going to look pretty terrible over composite, but that Easter egg works there. Well, I'll show the microware. Actually, if you do CLS 100 again, it just prints microware as we reset and then do CLS 100. Then their names appear again. So again, sorry it looks bad over composite. I believe that RGB is really necessary for it to look good in 80 columns. Good thing we're not over RF, eh? Okay, and the final Easter egg on the Coco line, this is the really ridiculous one. If you hold down Control and Alt, and then press that reset button on the back, you get <laughs> this picture. M. Hawkins, T. Harris, and T. Earls. Harris and Earls were in that Easter egg we just looked at. These are Microware employees. I've heard mixed reports on the story of this, but this bitmap uses like six kilobytes of precious ROM space. There was some story about how they couldn't fit the operating system in the existing ROM space, so they needed more. And I don't know who requested 8K, if it was just given to them and they only needed about 2K. Or if they asked for 8K so that they could stick this in. But anyway, <laughs> they, they, uh, they tied up a lot of ROM space sticking their, their faces here. Yeah, apparently Tandy was not happy about this once word of this Easter egg got out. I wonder if this is the most gratuitous Easter egg 
uh, up to that point in 1986. Uh, perhaps it is. There's a lot more to say about the Color Computer 3 some other time. It really is a fantastic computer. It's a really good thing that Tandy stuck with their 8-bit system and gave their loyal 8-bit users uh, a really great machine at the end of the line that, you know, they're still enjoying. Many, many people are still enjoying using these computers today. Okay, and the last computer we'll look at is my Tandy 102, which is the successor to the 100 that we looked at last time. Overall, it's in pretty good shape, but the badge here has seen better days. And there's also some marks on the screen that I just can't seem to get rid of. So I think it might be useful to compare the 100 and the 102. So the actual keyboards are almost identical, but these extra keys, these uh, function keys, they rearranged. I'm not sure if it was for any particularly good reason. On the original 100, F1 through F8 were on the left, while on the 102, F1 through F8 are in the middle. The paste, label, print, and break keys on the 100 have been moved over to the left on the 102, and the order's been scrambled around. And likewise, the cursor keys on the 100 were left, right, up, and down, and now they are left, down, up, and right. And to compare a bit more, 102 on the top, you can see it's noticeably thinner, has the same modem controls, although the buttons have been made a little bit bigger. On the back, again, 102 on the top. The cassette and foam ports are retained, although everything's inverted. Part of making the 102 thinner must have involved flipping all the ports around upside down. The printer port is the same. The RS-232C port has been moved over to make way for a system bus port. I don't know what actually makes use of this, but that's got to be handy. That could be cartridge port or direct hardware expansion. Access to the system bus is excellent, although I don't know what uses it. And here we have the power jack, the display contrast, and on and off switches, which has also been made bigger on the 102. And on the underside, it's nearly the same. There's the badge. It's interesting that they dropped the TRS-80 name and went with just Tandy. And this one was actually manufactured in 1988. Quite late. And the 102 is about a pound lighter, which surely people appreciated. Sorry again about those smudges on the screen. They just will not go away. So I've got them all 100 here. I felt bad that last time I couldn't get that Rick Y Easter egg to appear. I reset the computer and let's try it now. This is the same little program to reveal the Easter egg, run. Those are the various file names and there is Ricky. Hey Ricky. While of course those names are originally in ROM, the file system gets transferred to RAM. That's what we're looking at here is the internal file system. And I think we can corrupt it. So for example, if we just edit line 40, and even if we don't do anything, just escape, back out to the program, run again, and there. Ricky has been corrupted. Now he's do or do, at do. Okay, so now we're going to try this on the 102. Okay, here's the 102. It might, the screen might have slightly better contrast than the 100. We'll go into basic and so it's exactly the same program and we'll run it. Okay, and you see that the three designers, which on the Model 100 were Suzuki, Hayashi, and Ricky, have all just been replaced with garbage, even though the previous file names are still there. So as mentioned previously, Tandy doesn't take kindly to programmers putting their names in firmware on TRS-80 machines. 
So I got a hex editor and was comparing the differences between the Model 100 and 102 ROMs. And overall, they're very similar. But there's this section here that I've outlined with the red box with the 100 on the left and the 102 on the right. And you can see that just that group of bytes has been changed very specifically to delete the names of Suzuki, Hayashi, and Ricky. So I was wondering, is there a new egg in here? Or even just was there any rhyme or reason to how these were deleted? So I tried a bunch of things. I was looking to see if all the bits had been rotated or inverted or maybe XORed. So David Yaud suggested that maybe these bytes are opcodes like machine language. At first I was like, no, no, 32 and C3, those aren't valid opcodes, but <laughs> I'm so used to 6502, it doesn't occur to me that this is 8085 machine language, which is basically 8080. And sure enough, things like 32 and C3 are valid opcodes. So I got to work disassembling these little six byte batches, like right here. And yeah, it's totally valid 8085, like store and a jump. So I started searching the ROM and sure enough, it's called from 6CFC. And here's the code. And then it calls, I found an online Tandy 102 disassembly. And uh, it's calling this uh, optional external controller. So anyway, I, I was hoping that there would be new Easter eggs here or something like that. But really, they went ahead and used the space that Suzuki used to be at for a patch to the operating system for the 102. And likewise here, Hayashi calls this little bit of code. And here's the third patch was Ricky. And instead, it uh, calls this other routine. At least their names weren't erased in vain. <laughs> it was... I assume another programmer came along and made use of that space. That's all I've got for this episode. Maybe in a future episode, I'll take a deeper look at some of these TRS-80 machines. Maybe it won't be until next Septandi. I don't know. Thanks to my patrons for their support. If you're interested in being a patron, check out the description in the link below. If you haven't subscribed, please do. And no matter what, thanks for watching. We'll talk to you next time. Flying high above the surface, river of wind washes the planet clean. The earth reshaped by the convergence, aloft in the slipstream. In pursuit of a well-dressed man running around the ruined mountain rim. Falls from high, pulled by grappling hook He thought the wind would save him